Okay, I'm uh, Lucy. I'm Nicholas. Eden will be here shortly. Okay. And I'm Ed, Captain Jack's number one fan. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> this is first episode, and we're going to get to him eventually. It's going to be a long chat, no doubt. So, yeah, I guess the usual opening thoughts. I like this one, but I don't think I like it as much as everyone else, but I do like it. Uh, it's one of the few episodes that isn't but ugly this season, I know this. It does still have a little bit of that vapor rub on the lens look, but it's not as bad. Maybe it's just the fact that not everything is orange. Like, we actually have a cool color palette for once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're in a dark setting. And the fact that it's directed, like, not all the time, but it feels like it has more of a movie sense of direction than a TV sense of direction sometimes. Like, I don't know, maybe it's just that the way this show is shot looks better with blue than it does with orange everywhere. Because that's, like, the only two colors we get this series are orange everywhere and blue everywhere. And Vaseline on the lens. Ah, uh, this one has a darker tone to it, too, even though we do get a happy ending. Which... It's definitely, I don't want to say the most morbid, because the most morbid is probably the one we just did. But it is one of the most morbid of the series, season, whatever. Yeah, we do have a dead child, basically, or zombie-like child. Zombie child in the middle of the London Blitz infecting other possibly dead people. A hysterical five-year-old looking for his mummy. <laughs> well, you know, you would. Anyway, Edward, your overall thoughts on the episode? This two-part, in my opinion, is the best story in the first series oh. of Doctor Who, and best performance Christopher Eccleston gave is in these two episodes. I still think Dalek is his best performance in the series. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like, in terms of quality of writing, this is probably the best episode. But I'm honestly not sure which episode I would give it Chris's best performance. I find that hard to do with any of the Doctors. Like, in terms of acting performance, they seem generally consistent throughout any story they're in. The one exception, I think, with uh, Peter Capaldi, and I know that this is, like, getting sidetracked, but I think he's the one of the 12 main Doctors we've had who has a performance that's notably better than any other performance he's given because of the material, but Heaven Sent. Like, with Peter Capaldi, Heaven Sent is just so obviously, like, the most acting material that he's been given. With everyone else, it's sort of close enough where I don't think about it. I'm sure if I gave it some thought, this might be Chris's best acting performance, but that's not really what stuck out to me. I think the finale, he was probably at his best with the regeneration scene and all that. I think that was probably his best performance for me anyway. Yeah, agreeing with everyone else. And also, Jack. Jack is introduced. We'll get to And that is, yeah, side characters acting great. Rose was tolerable. Stop. I'm going to stop you right there because that is the big problem of the episode for me. And that is, like, here we are officially. Rose is the absolute land like i was wondering when it would happen i was wondering when we would get to the point that i could stop giving rose slack because i've been surprisingly kind to her in these live streams and i think that stops now because she is the worst thing about this episode well why do you think she's the worst she really doesn't stand out to me in this episode personally to like get overwhelmed by all of the cool things and the doctor and jack and all of the scariness But, like, we're following her for a little bit. Like, we're introduced to Jack through her. She is the audience's eyes in those scenes. But she does have a big presence in this story. And it's just, it's the Mickey thing again. The writers have no clue how we're supposed to handle her relationship with Mickey. If we kind of kept going the way we were going with, like, Father's Day. Because in that episode, she says she sort of has someone but doesn't really... And here we have Jack's psychic paper, which is reading her mind and says, yes, I have a boyfriend, but I consider myself double. And I'm like, no, that's not Jack projecting. That's not like someone else assuming things about how Rose feels or what she's thinking. That's the show telling us Rose considers Mickey her boyfriend, but also doesn't well, really care at all about cheating on her. Well, uh, you have a boyfriend, but you consider yourself footloose and fancy free. And then she says something and Jack is like, another word is available and another word is very. This is all coming from Rose. <laughs> I can understand the mindset of someone who would be like, ah, who cares? It's just a domestic stupid thing in this show that's not supposed to be focused on that. But, like, don't cheat on people. 
Yeah. Good people don't cheat on their significant others, and now that's a character trait of one of our main characters, that she does that and doesn't care. She wants to be with the doctor, and if given a chance, I think she would get with Jack. And she wants to keep Mickey as, like, her pet, so it's, <laughs> the way you think about it. That's the thing, I had a discussion with another one of my friends about this episode. They read this episode also as, like, romantic tension between the doctor and Rose, and I don't know, I just don't get that. Like, that's not I something... Saw it. I get it with the whole dancing, euphemism, whatever. They talk about dancing a lot, and you could read the doctors being jealous of Jack, but I just... That doesn't register for me. It registers a little for me. Well, Stephen Moffat had some things to say about the dancing metaphor in this episode in Doctor Who Confidential, and it's essentially sex and the Rose pitting the Doctor and Jack against each other. Once we get to more episodes written by Moffat, this is inevitably going to become like a running theme. Is this like symptomatic of his gender politics that this is even a thing? I don't think Rose viewing the Doctor that way is in other episodes enough. I'm reading this as possibly just a Stephen Moffat thing. Is rooted in Rose's character as a shallow person who's obsessed with the Doctor and doesn't really care about Mickey. But to the extent it is, I don't think we would be getting this if someone else wrote this episode. I don't think so. I mean, I see it throughout the series. It just seems like she does have a thing for the Doctor and does like him in a, you know sexual attractive way. I, I don't think it's a often thing at all. Yeah, and I suppose you're also right in that, like, the same thing happens with Adam, in that she's just, she gets attracted to people, I guess, anyone who isn't Mickey. If you walk, are male and aren't Mickey, Rose will get attracted to you at some point, and, you know, you're not her dad. It's weird that you mentioned, like, pinning them against each other. She kind of likes it when the doctors is almost jealous, it seems like to me. She seems like this is the one that she wants, the doctor. And everybody else pawns in her little game. Yeah, and it's like, it's hard to be too angry about it because this is clearly a character who doesn't know they're doing that. But at the same time, she's just a shallow, flighty person, and that's not a very good character. Like, she's so easy to hate and dislike. Oh, yes. But I forgive people for, like, not noticing it. If when we're starting from the beginning of this, we're, like, looking at it from the eyes of somebody who's starting this out in 2005. Not that Rose isn't bad on her own in this episode. But she's worse knowing she's what comes yeah, later. Having, having already decided having that we hate her. The whole scene with her and Jack on the invisible spaceship, and they're dancing, and she's just, like, tuning out everything he says because she's so head over heels for him is really obnoxious. <laughs> but we've already sort of established Jack as the guy who flirts with everyone and who everyone is sort of attracted to. Not enough that, like, I can't help but just see Rose as being just like a head over heels schoolgirl, and that's dumb. Granted, we see later that everybody else sort of has that reaction to Jack, too. Hmm. That's true. <laughs> Not that Rose isn't obnoxious with it, but, like, that is sort of just Jack's character in general. Where, like, he's got high-tech everything. He seems more swashbuckly. And then that illusion is quickly broken. Yeah, since we're on the subject of Jack anyway, I, I might as well bring that up. I appreciate now more than I ever did how much of a real slime ball he is in the first <laughs> part of this story. <laughs> like, later on, Jack, he's like... Un- Questionably a good person. He's really chunky. He's unquestionably awesome. Established as a con man. Yeah, and it's like, it's not just that a con man is his vocation and that's bad enough, but it's like the way John Barrowman plays it, he is really obnoxiously cheesy. <laughs> yeah, he's cheesy, arrogant. He's a guy who it would be a blast to hang out with, but not someone that you really like. American stereotype. I suppose. Like, is. <laughs> Is that why we would cast someone with an American accent? Or especially since this is said during World War II, you could read that subtext into it, I guess, where we've got the Nazis as, like, a background. They're not really in the story, but their presence is felt. And, of course, the protagonists are British. And then we have this third party who's American and sort of swaggers in like he knows the situation but really caused all the problems. Like, that I mean, might be projecting, but who knows? Well, it's like with Jack, he was written with in mind of, like, the Doctor if he was an American sci-fi action hero. 
So basically written by Chevy Chase from Community. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's much more cool. Captain Jack is Dr. Space Time from Community confirmed. <laughs> He does come around by the end of the episode, but, like, they do the thing where he leaves and you think he's gone, and then he comes back and saves the day. And I was surprised how much, like, I bought it when that moment comes that, yeah, he would just leave these guys to save his own butt if he wanted to. A lot of parallels to Han Solo. Yeah, the same brand of charming, but, you know, willing to kill a guy if if it'll get him their way. I told you, he's Captain Kirk. The original series, Captain Kirk, sure. Yeah. Mm, not really. Kirk was a very level-headed guy. He also committed Dave's side. Yeah, he, he, he would just blow people out of the sky and out of existence if they screwed with him too much, and not even in, like, a threatening-his-life way. But I suppose Kirk does have, like you said, a level-headedness. It's not that Jack isn't level-headed, it's just that... That he starts out a bit of a jackass. Yeah, he's just kind of a slime ball who takes a lot of pleasure in being awful. He even says that he views himself more as a criminal. Yeah, when he's explaining the con to the Doctor and Rose, like, laying out his plan, he's like, I was gonna play you guys for suckers, it was gonna be so awesome. Pompeii is nice if you wanna make a vacation out of it, but you have to set your alarm clock to Volcano Day. Yeah, that line, especially, that's something that a not good person says. By the end of the episode, he does seem to become a good person, and continues to be a good person throughout the series grows more in two episodes than rose does in two seasons oh we're doing boomtown next like his character in that episode isn't really something that i've ever thought to like track because i've always just assumed he was kind of the same guy through most of it but i wonder how much of it is he a good person like has he become the jack that we know by the end of this episode or do we really have to wait till the end of the series where he's at the status quo we see of Torchwood. We would have to wait till the first part of the finale. Yeah, Jack's morality through the next couple episodes is something I am going to try and keep track of, see if we do anything else interesting with it. And we might as well talk about the child. Are you my Ta- mommy? I've, like, left messages on people's phones just saying, are you my mommy? Stephen Moffat seems to be the one guy on this show who will write a thing that gets stuck in people's heads for over a decade. And, like, a lot of that is that Moffat is a writer who likes to use repetition. Take a drink for every Moffat episode that involves lines being repeated ad nauseum for dramatic effect. I'll have to get another Coca-Cola. Yeah, Coca-Cola. Because, you know, we're all about product placement here on the Doctor Who for views. <laughs> There's no way that, like, they foresaw doing a spinoff about this guy as no. they're writing this episode. No. Do you think? Or do you- well, Russell T. Davies did say before he planned on reviving Doctor Who that he had the idea for Torchwood. Okay. Like, the code name for Doctor Who while it was in production, right? Yeah, it was. So, to prevent pirating. So it's entirely possible. I mean, it's not impossible that... He says, hey, Steven, write an episode with this guy, Captain Jack, because he's going to be a major character and he's going to be the Torchwood guy later. I wish I I knew the answer for that, personally. I don't know. When you watch it, I wouldn't think had him in mind as a spinoff show. To me, it seemed like they wanted to make him a permanent companion. Yeah, that's what I would The last episode of this series wouldn't be him getting left behind. That's what I mean. I think they wanted to make him like a main companion, and then they had the torch with him. How about we just throw him in there and change their plans at the very last second? Because it's kind of weird that they just leave him there. Jack probably would have stayed longer if Christopher Eccleston stayed longer because Jack was there to to have the young man dashing aspect of the show that Christopher Eccleston just doesn't have, but David Tent and Matt Smith do. Christopher Eccleston isn't young enough. It's just that John Barrowman appeals to a certain crowd more, I guess. And I was part of that crowd. Plays nine in a... Not as charming. Yeah. 
more blunt is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. But yeah, we were going to talk about the actual antagonists of the episode and, and how, how they're terrifying. Horrifying and how I posted the episode on like 10 seconds on Snapchat and people were like, why would you give me nightmares? DFD Child is the only one of two monsters that scared me as a kid watching Doctor Who. Was the other one Weeping Angels? No, it was the Midnight Entity. Oh, yeah. Mine were the only ones I've ever been scared at. The Weeping Angels, the Empty Child, and the Peg Dolls. And I haven't watched that episode since probably it came out. <laughs> it's creepy, but I have never got scared by it. I didn't get scared to the extent that other people did. But I was just, like, creeped out for the night. I'm trying to remember, like, because I think it's been one. One monster in this entire series of me watching it so far that's actually, like, viscerally scared me. And I'm struggling to remember what it was, but it wasn't these guys. Are we talking nine or just... And in general. general. Was it the Bastion Nevada? No. Like, not slightly creeped out. I remember one monster in Doctor Who that's actually terrified me. I can't remember what it is. Was it the Beast? No, uh, but in concept, these guys are terrifying. Especially when you realize it's now Jean's gone wrong. Yeah, and I suppose this is as good a time as any to talk about like how really good with just sci-fi concepts Stephen Moffat is. Like, no matter how bad some of his episodes get, he's better than RTD at creating just concepts that feel like they belong in a science fiction thing. Yeah, and... I mean, Russell did create the Slovene. <laughs> And having characters, like, sum it up in a line. The antagonist of this episode is physical injuries as plague. That's like a writing prompt thing. Like, make an amazing story about a plague that is physical injuries. It's like, that's just such a creative concept. It's also sort of horrifying. I mean, of all the, like, scripts in the RTD era, it's like, Moffat's had the least change to them because RTD thought that they were just so good that nothing needed to be done with them. Yeah. I suppose if we are to compare the two of them a little bit, just for the sake of this point, it's like RTD likes to really focus on the human drama stuff, and the sci-fi elements of his episodes tend to be really generic and just there for the sake of furthering the characters. Moffat, we do do the character drama thing, especially once he takes over, but for the most part, it's like, let's explore this really neat idea, see the implications. It's more on concepts. I think just in terms of making people scared of, like, menial things. Do we want to talk about, outside of his performance, the Doctor's role in this episode? This is like the big win, like... The episode where people finally understand who the Ninth Doctor is. Yeah. He's been battle-scarred, lost so many people that, like, out of the situation, and no one died, and that is his ultimate win. And this is, again, just the thing that I think defines Moffat, is that he understands this character. He writes all of his Doctors as the same guy and leaves it up to the actors to really emphasize the differences. Like, that starts to get less true, again, once he takes over the show. But looking at his scripts in the RTD era, starting here, it's very clear that he has a concrete vision of this character that is the same for every story he writes. I guess you can look at it that way, but it's a little harder because we only have, like, this one story to compare Nine and then, like, Ten's era. I know. Doesn't it feel like Moffat, out of all the writers who we've talked about so far, knows what character he's writing the most? Probably. Yeah, yeah him and Paul Cornell. There's definitely um, similarities in the four modern doctors that you can't really see. Or you can, but like aren't as prominent in like, classic series or even episodes where Moffat isn't writing slash show running. Like, the comparisons between the four of them is something we could honestly do a whole independent stream about. Yeah, we probably should. Let's do that. Since Eden brought it up, we should also talk about his relationship. Mom, actual lady that the child is chasing, name. Nancy. Nancy. It's, it's like, I don't know why something with an L kept popping into my head. Me too. Like, I <laughs> thought it was Lucy or something. But no, Nancy is really cool, really nice supporting character. Has an actually touching moment with Rose. Yeah. 
If they got the wrong actor, then that character would have completely flopped. She does a good job of feeling she's much older than she is. Yeah. And that she's got a secret. Which is, is, I think she looks even younger than she's supposed to be in the face. Yeah. Like, her character is 19. She looks like she could be 15. And I think that works. I and mean, everyone just assumes that she's like, you know, 15 years old. In reality, that she's much older. That makes it more of like a hit, like a hit for the audience when it's like, oh, she's not it's sister, it's her mother. I like the Doctor's whole dynamic with that group of kids in general, mm-hmm. which is just another Moffat thing that he likes writing the Doctor with children. And they always have, like, impeccable chemistry. It's kind of cool since it is a family show and stuff, so you see the Doctor can interact with the kids. Well, chick- yeah. Moffat wrote Eleven practically like an oversized kid. At times. Something that people say regarding Moffat's gender politics is just that his writing of female characters can be either really good or really weak. If Rose is an example of really weak female writing on his part, Nancy's an example of a really effectively strong female character. Like, she doesn't take part in action or anything, but, like, here's a 19-year-old girl who keeps her cool in spite of the fact that it's the London Blitz, there's a friggin' monster chasing everyone that also happens to be her son, so she feels all of this responsibility on top of the fact that he's technically dead. It doesn't register for her that he could be alive underneath all that, and so he's just this monstrosity, and yet she's really competent and keeps charge of the whole situation, and it's a really distinct character, and it's cool. Yeah, she does show symptoms of repressive behavior. We should talk about the effect before we stop talking about this thing, where it's, uh... The effect where the gas mask comes out of a person's mouth and eyes. That it's, was the most nightmare I've seen in this show. It's a really good special effect. Yeah, like, no wonder they only did it once. Like, it holds up. Like, yeah, I don't think you could do that effect better, better. today. Yeah, probably not. Though it looks a little bit dated now, it still looks good, unlike Plastic Mickey. Yeah, like I don't even think it looks that dated, especially with the way the eyes turn into the the eyes of the mask is just horrifying. The funny thing about the masks was that they had a problem with the original ones, then the production team had to make 28 new ones from scratch right before filming. But it's just the idea of your eyes becoming like hard plastic like that's what your eyes are now it's ugh. yeah like you can still kind of talk because you have vocal cords and the sound is coming out of a place mm-hmm. but your mouth is gone the whole thing's a creepy idea basically your whole face is turning to a gas mask and then it gets really disturbing when we find out what caused it and it turned out to be jack's major con that went wrong and yeah I, and I- it had twelve nano genes inside. They couldn't differentiate between the skull and the object. It's made out of bones. That yes. part of your face would be directly connected to your skull. Yeah. Because I've been debating a little bit whether Jack can be considered an antagonist for at least part of this episode, and I suppose he is. Not really. I think he's more of a like an anti-hero. To say he's anti-hero or antagonist, I think he's just a con man that didn't oh. really meant to do anything wrong, and it just everything backfired. And at first, he doesn't seem to really care, but as the episode goes on, he does realize this is wrong and tries to fix it. Because he's slowly realizing his love for the Doctor. I thought I would have more to say about this episode, but most of it is just how terrible Rose is. <laughs> Like I, everything else. Damn it, Rose! Like, I keep remembering lines of, like, why she's so bad. Like, when she's flirting with Jack, or Jack is, like, coming under, and she's like, do you really think now is the best time to be coming on to me? And Jack's like, perhaps not. And then she's like, well, it was just a suggestion. What are you doing, Rose? What is your problem? Hey, you- I would act the same way, okay? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> like, John Barrowman's attractive, don't get me wrong, and he's got the swagger and everything, but, like, did Rose have a lobotomy? Is she just a complete idiot? Um, Go with Rose being a complete idiot. <laughs> just a complete idiot. I mean, he's, he's a 51st century guy. He's just a bit better at dancing. It's quite flexible. I suppose we should also talk about the fact that we're introducing, like, the two missing years of Jack's life, and that will never, ever be resolved. The first thing going... Plot thread 
happened to be Moffat's first episode. Oh, wow, Moffat haters jab at oh, the old day with yeah. that. Did he ever get those years back? No, and we never nope. get them again. They're not so much as brought up in any other episode or Torchwood. Got resolved in some random comic from years ago that everybody forgot. Like, we will address Jack's backstory in Torchwood episodes, but it's never that backstory. Considering that Jack is something that Moffat probably got told to put into the episode, that has to be something that Russell T. Davies came up with, right? Those two missing years can't just be a thing Moffat threw into this script. Personally, this is just uh, first season jitters, like uh, the Reapers. You know, it's like, okay, we wanted to do this, or we wanted to set this established thing, but as the more they thought about it, they said, well, maybe not. Like I said, I think he was going to be a main companion, and that, that was going to be part of the storyline, probably in season two, but I think they scrapped it when they went off to Torchwood and just forgot about it. That it was still in the episode. But I mean, once he has his own show, then you've yeah. got time to address that, and they never do. Everyone forgot. It just feels like, okay, we were going to do this, and then they just changed their minds. It's a really weird thing to do with a character. In Torchwood, they brought up Torchwood 4 being missing, and that never gets resolved or hinted at again. Well, the, I didn't watch that part of Torchwood. I don't remember a lot of Torchwood except Miracle Day. And... I've watched Miracle Day and Children of Earth in their entirety, and I've just sort of skipped around seasons one and two. So, But for now, we've just got Captain Jack, professional douchebag. <laughs> Who grows to be a better person over his time in the TARDIS. Yeah. That... He's not a complete douchebag, because he does try to sacrifice himself at the end and redeems himself, so. And is rather nervous when he realizes he has no escape pod. Oh, yeah. I love the escape pods. It's, it's, it's hilarious. That is, I think, an argument to be made for that he hasn't become completely a good self-sacrificing person by the end, because he takes the bomb assuming that he has a way to get rid of it. That's true. Like, I love how he says, check under the sink. That's like, there's a check everywhere. Affirmative. Under the sink. (laughs) Affirmative. Which means he has a sink in there. (laughs) He has a lot of things in there. It does look like a bit of a cluttered mess. He has two items that'll be reused by River Son. Yeah, and it's it's weird that he's never come back in another Moffat episode, considering that's where he started. Does he count as a Moffat character? Not really. He was nah. an RTD creation. It's just that this happens in TV all the time, where writers get assigned to introduce characters that other people created. I swear, there was this, like, point that's like a super nitpick that I can't even remember like what If it's it a fully super was. nitpick it's probably for the best. No, it was don't. just like it was just like I think it was one of the night when nine was talking about um blah 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 the war blah 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 it sucks until one tiny island decides like no more or whatever that speech was. The speech he gives to Nancy. Yeah, and I was just like, not to like take away from the fact that Britain had contributions in World War II. It did. It totally did. But there were other countries that also helped finish the war. Winston Churchill and FDR, FDW. But yeah, like the idea of that speech is that Britain led the charge, I guess. So and- I'm just going to go hide under the desk now. While Edward hides, I'm just going to give final thoughts. Final thoughts. It's good. Rose is not. Outside of Rose being an awful, terrible person, this was a really cool episode. It's really tightly plotted, which is something that I can't say of a lot of later Moffat episodes. 10 out of 10. I'm not doing numbers, like I said, but this is, yeah. We're not partial to numerical ratings, but I say 9.5. 9.65. Rose keeps it from being perfect. 9.65. But it is really, really good. I also like the little plot point of Rose's shirt, though. Lucy, final thoughts. I like it. I think it's pretty good. I think it's a really solid episode. I really can't think anything wrong with it, per se. I like Jack. I wish they had more in the series, personally. Mm. I was so sad when we didn't get any Jack after the uh, in the eleventh Doctor. Mm. It was so sad to my little Jack-loving heart, my non-existent heart. Edward, final thoughts. Edward's final thoughts are that he's under the table. <laughs> I'm back. You're back just in time for us all to leave. Perfect episode. Nothing wrong with it. 
10 out of 10. No. Jack is awesome. He's gone. He's already left. He preempted my exit. We had Fine. An exit speech. Okay, Phoenix, you can come to the camera now. Whatever. Bye. So long and thanks for all the fish. Bye.